Bueno, vamos, vamos a seguir en right. esta programación. Well, let's continue with our program. Ver, pues, está por todos As los, you can see, it's full of all of these different decir, drivers of this volcanic event in Lanzarote. We've had a volcanologist, we've had a cook, and we're also going to try and understand over these days the ecosystem. Our next uh, guest is from the American continent. He's the president of Volcanoes Without Borders, Volcanes Sin Fronteras. He's going to talk to us about how it's possible to live in harmony with 200 volcanoes and how his country, Costa Rica, where these 200 volcanoes are present, well, how they manage this volcanic risk that Joanne talked us about, how this risk should be managed, and also how to harness all of this. this huge, often terrible power that volcanoes possess. So we have the president of Volcanoes Without Borders, Gino Gonzalez. 55 years of tragedy. The avalanche that we were expecting came. It was huge. It was an absolutely massive avalanche. They were huge rocks. And that was what happened that night. It took everything with it. This is our first documentary on volcanoes, tragedies related to volcanoes. Pero no sabíamos que el, que el cerro Arenal era un volcán. Sandy Hill was actually a volcano. Salgan, dice, porque ese animal, si se llamó volcán, va a ser un volcán. Es un animal, en la forma de un volcán. La erupción tan grande, tan pavoroso que eso... Pensé que iba a burlar mis eardrums, era tan fuerte. Se nos llevó puta. ¿Qué pasó? 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 El cuadro que nos encontramos fue fue Dante. Like a scene from Dante. I'd never no seen a, a dead body like that. So I thought it was the end of the world. Maldito! You took my father away. Well, these uh, two videos that you've just had a glimpse of, they're trailers, actually, for documentaries that are on YouTube, they're free to see, and the idea is to try to not forget the memory of those volcanic eruptions. Of course, things like the stories that we're seeing in La Palma today, we don't want to forget them because our memories actually are very short. This, I think, is one of the most beautiful volcanoes I've ever seen. It's called the Poas volcano. If you've been to Costa Rica, I'm sure you've seen it. We have a green lake. Una laguna fría que se llama la Laguna Botos. A cold lake called the Botas otra. Lake. <laughs> que oh, se llama gosh. la Laguna Caliente. And there's another lake de which is a hot lake. And that's the one over here. Cráter activo. Which has a white color. And this is actually the active si crater of the Poas si or este Volcano caso, Complex. Son una serie de volcanes. You can see it at the top of the image. It's a whole series of volcanoes that make up this whole complex. This was where I began my career in volcanology, the 8th of December. I remember it like it was yesterday. My knees were shaking from the adrenaline, from the nerves, and I knew that this was going to be a meeting with the love of my life. Volcanes Sin Fronteras es una organización. Volcanoes Without Borders, then, is an association. As you'll see from our logo, the idea is to combine different thoughts and knowledge to do with volcanoes. Because when we usually think about volcanoes, we think of red and black. But for us, they are more than that. They're 
a combination of different professionals, people that study all kinds of things, not just volcanology. So, I invite you to follow us on social media. We are an NGO. Operamos bajo el estatuto de una asociación y esto inicia en el 2017. We've gradually grown over the years, and here you can see some of our highlights. This is who we are, a mixture of all different faces. People who are trying to learn about volcanoes and teach others about them. Our organization is divided into six main parts. Geological research, of course, is key. Ecosystems which is something we're going to be looking at throughout this conference, these unique volcanic ecosystems, production, because many of our products in Costa Rica come from volcanoes, health, because when there's an eruption, of course, the ash affects our health. And we also have problems with water, with high fluoride content in volcanic areas. Communication is absolutely key because we wouldn't exist without it. And the main part, actually, of our NGO is working with communities because those people that live close to volcanoes are the most vulnerable. They're the ones that live day to day alongside. I would actually quite like to live next to a volcano one day, but I'd like to be able to escape as well if necessary. So, there are two guiding paths for our, uh, our organization. Our mission is to create and to transmit knowledge about volcanoes, to reduce vulnerability of the population, and also to try to promote harnessing the resources. And our vision is to be an organization that promotes an improved quality of life via the dissemination of information and knowledge about volcanoes. Volcanoes are life, even though that may seem an unusual statement. Life, as we know, is made up of two basic components, water and organic components. At one point in time, our planet was a ball of melted material. The gases inside that were creating the material necessary for life. Actually, maybe you've seen these NASA images from these uh, rovers that they send to Mars, and they find places that used to contain water, old lakes, because that, and they always search for this because they know that they will find traces of life, and this is true of volcanoes. In the middle of this image, you can see a petroglyph. It's quite old, it's not in a great condition, but it's located in the Rincón de la Vieja volcano. It's absolutely stunning place. And our ancestors, um, I invite you to come and see, actually, but this is supposed to depict a woman giving birth, and actually in the petroglyph you can distinguish a baby inside the woman's uh, stomach, and it's located at a hot spring, it's directly opposite a hot spring. And our elders believe that this hot water helped to dilate the uterus to assist uh, giving birth. On the right hand side, we have an image depicting the sacrifice of virgins to calm the lava of this volcano. When the Spanish arrived, they called it the door to hell. Sometimes, volcanoes are referred to as goddesses. 
Sometimes they have names of goddesses. For instance, in Tanzania, Uluinuingai is the mountain of God. On Tak in Japan means the mountain of God. Or Fuji, which in Japanese actually means the immortal or the only one. So where does this idea come from? Well, I was walking in Momotombo once in Nicaragua. I was driving and I saw this volcano in front of me and 20 minutes later, it was still there. It was always there. Of course, it's not going anywhere, but it's something that's immovable. And so, omnipresent, omnipresent let's say, for our ancestors. You can imagine that for them, seeing this mountain, even today, if I see this image with this shadow behind the mountain, it really looks something quite godlike. There are also petroglyphs in this place, so you can see these uh, figures and also these uh, bowls dug out in the ground, which are locations where rituals used to be carried out by our ancestors. Let's look at Costa Rica then. Where is it? And why is it a little bit different to the Canary Islands? Well, Costa Rica, in fact, has all of the basic ingredients for active volcanoes and earthquakes. But our volcanoes are formed in a slightly different way, via subduction. What this means is that a tectonic plate, in this case the Cocos plate, goes underneath the Caribbean plate. This is a geological process that creates earthquakes and volcanic explosions, uh, volcanic eruptions that are particularly explosive in our case. This image is part of a, a research project that we're doing right now, investigating how earthquakes have an impact on volcanic eruptions. Volcanoes in Costa Rica are places where you can find quite unique uh, ecosystems. Alexander Humboldt, the German scientist, traveled around the equator to look at how ecosystems change. He found it interesting, rather than traveling around to lots of places, to stay in one place but to change in altitude, to see what differences occurred at different uh, levels of altitude. In Costa Rica, we have a very unique marine ecosystem in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the uh, Isla del Coco. We also have uh, 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 dry and wet tropical forest. And we also have these extremophiles. So this means organisms that are able to survive in very, very high temperatures. And the image that you see at the top is the highest forest that we have in our region, which is home to microorganisms that live inside the lake there, subaquatic plants. So all of these are examples of life systems that, that exist inside our volca volcanoes. So we also have people that coexist with uh, volcanoes. Two million actually live on active volcanoes. Our two main airports are located on top of volcanic areas. So this gives you an idea of the risk that we're living uh, under. This image was taken in 1963, and on the right-hand side, we see the same place. Actually, John F. Kennedy went to visit Costa Rica. He saw this volcanic eruption on the left that released so much ash. But you can see 70 years, or 60 years later, things have changed. 
también es fusivo, como se daba en el volcán Arenal. Excuse volcanism in the Arenal volcano. So this was erupting over 40 years, but they also have explosive volcanism. For instance, the Poas volcano, which occurred in 2017. We only had three days notice before this volcano erupted. How many volcanoes are there? Well, we talk about 200, but really we're not sure because there's so many. And we have this underwater mountain range, the biggest in the American continent. It seems to be connected, in fact, with the Galapagos Islands and the Coco Island. There are so many underwater that it's very challenging to to identify all of the volcanoes that exist. We have another volcanic mountain range called the Guanacaste. Number three is the Tilaran, and number four is the Central Range. So our volcanoes are located on this main ridge that crosses across the country. When I talk to people in Costa Rica about our volcanoes, I show them how they're present in our day-to-day -day lives. 60% of people that visit us come to see a volcano or they visit a volcano during their trip. So it's a big part of our tourism. We also have uh, hotels and beers, of course, that are really, really delicious. We have uh, volcanic emblems on all of these products, and even our uh, coat of arms for our country shows volcanoes. So you can see in some of these images that there's smoke coming out of the volcanoes. And we even carry volcanoes in our pockets because they're depicted on our coins. My mission then at my NGO is to put this puzzle together to assemble this image in a more clear way of a volcanic country. Also, thanks to our volcanoes, there are many uh, sources of, of energy. Actually, our energy is 100% renewable. We don't use uh, fuel for electricity. Rather, we rely on hydroelectricity and other forms. We have the geothermal project at Miravalles, and we have wind farms in the Orosi Valley, which is situated and uh, surrounded by volcanoes. So volcanoes help us to achieve this goal of having 100% renewable energy. We also have gastronomy that is particular to these volcanic areas. Anyone who comes to Costa Rica must try the rice and beans available in different formats. We also have uh, tamales, which is a, a recipe typical at Christmas time. Our strawberries are absolutely delicious. We have many other recipes. And most of our agricultural land is located on volcanic areas. Coriander and salads usually has some kind of influence from volcanoes, even your milk that you drink in the morning. So every visit to Costa Rica is, is full of volcanic flavors. We created this idea to be a volcanologist for a day. We actually got this idea from visiting a lot. We saw that the gastronomy was very linked to the volcanoes. And the guides that took us around the area were volcanologists. So now let's see our second video, please. Okay, this is Volcanologo por un día. So this is the activity, this project to be a volcanologist for a day. This is our, our 
most important project. Del estudio de los volcanes, les enseñamos sobre minerales, hacemos experimentos. So we teach en them about different minerals, we do different experiments. Rocas que hay expulsadas por los volcanes. We look at the different rocks Vamos that are emitted from the volcanoes. We visit communities that have been affected by the communities. We look at the lava flows, the rivers that have formed in this area. It's a very interactive experience. People really get to discover how volcanoes behave. We have children, very young children sometimes, and also older people participating. We've had around 1,200 participants so far in this project. And the idea is for them to see geology and volcanoes as something beautiful, the same way that we see it, volcanologists. So we've been working on it, as I say, for some time now, and we would love you to visit us if you do make it to Costa Rica one day. It began in 2018, actually, and of course with the pandemic we had to press the pause button, but our goal is to restart this project in the near future. Thank you. Let's go back to the presentation now. Great. So one of the other things that we try to teach the population and teach children is how to coexist with these volcanoes. This project is called Monte Olimpo. This is, of course, the home of the ancient Greek gods. And also, the biggest star in our solar system, the biggest mountain, sorry, in our solar system is called Mount Olympus. It's on Mars. We ask them what they think a volcano is, and then we have a talk about it. And then we ask them to show us their drawings before and after having this informative talk about volcanoes. So beforehand, you can see that they've drawn a huge volcano. When children draw something big, it means that they find it intimidating. And we can see in the second picture, they've drawn a, a volcano much smaller. You can even see the different particles, the lapilli, the, the, the things that have been uh, belched out of the, the volcano. Here's another example. Once again, we can see a big volcano on the left. You can see the houses right below. And after our program, I at least see a much calmer volcano. You can at least see the sun in the background. It seems a much more calm and harmonious uh, picture. You can even see the lake here of Boas as well. I think this is a good way of measuring the impact of an educational program like this. I personally work in research, but also with communities. As scientists, we are trusted, we're competent, we have integrity, and we're open enough to be able to talk with other people about these issues. So, our approach then is that if we offer up knowledge to people, if, if you come to our area and we teach you about it, this will lead to prevention and with that vulnerability decreases. At the same time, if you know more about the place where you live, then you're more likely to take care of it. This will encourage citizen participation and taking ownership of your territory. With that, we have resilience. It's a very uh, common use, uh, commonly used word nowadays. In Latin American, we have a very short memory, even more so when it comes to uh, disasters. After three months, we've forgotten completely what happened. But with this process, we remember. 
with this knowledge, with this increased of emphasis on uh, historical memory, this could promote more interest in science in later generations, just like the pandemic will perhaps produce. And all of this together should improve people's lives. There is a Japanese uh, premise after the 2011 earthquake. Children went to a place called Kamaishi. They were evacuated there when the tsunami arrived. They were evacuated before. And these were the premises. Uh, don't believe the, the, everything that you hear and take initiative. Sometimes, however, volcanoes need space. We need to give them that space. And for example, the Rincón de la Vieja erupted very violently around three months ago. The Arenal had a great deal of pyroclastic material launched out. It seems that these days, young people try to get close to these volcanoes to get likes on their social media. And unfortunately, this encourages other people to also get too close to the volcanoes. And this is an increasing problem that we're seeing in, in Costa Rica, especially in the case of these explosive volcanoes, because often they give no warning. And if there are people nearby, then, well, they're in serious danger. The Poas volcano did give us a couple of days' notice, and we were able to close the park before the eruption. Of course, in a way, it's good that it did erupt, because if scientists predict an eruption that doesn't happen, then we lose all credibility. But we were able to predict it, and we were successful in our prediction. I felt like I just scored the winning goal in a World Cup, because it's so hard, actually, to read these signals of these volcanoes. And it was a way of saying, well, we're not that silly after all. Irasu is another volcano that had a quite violent eruption around 60 years ago. And the Turialba, which is always bothering us. There are lots of different risks involved with our volcanoes. In La Palma, you have these long lava flows, which is something that we don't struggle so much with. But we have uh, different gases, acidic gases, which can accumulate in the air and can be very dangerous. We have these ballistic explosions, these materials that fly out very long dif distances. We also have these Lajares. This is a, a combination of volcanic rock and water, and they accumulate in many areas in Costa Rica, and also ash, which can, of course, travel a great dif distance, affect our agriculture and air traffic. So, to work with all of these issues, we have a National Commission for Emergencies. It has quite a complex structure, at least I think it looks a bit complex here. When you're talking about man managing risks, there should be a very simple structure in a way. But this is basically the way we work to try and prepare ourselves for the next eruption, because we know it's going to come. To finish, I'd like to end with one uh, quote from the Secretary General of the 
He said, if I had to write a sentence to describe the state of the world, I'd say that we're living in a world where global challenges are much more integrated and the responses are much more fragmented. And if this isn't corrected, then we will be heading for disaster. So with this, the idea is that we all live on the same planet and we need to learn to live in harmony with volcanoes. This is a bit of an advert. I love cooking. I'm an amateur, really not a pro at all. But this is my very simple version of pyroclastic cooking. So I'm thrilled to be here to learn from you wonderful chefs at this conference. That's everything from me. Thank you.